Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Giri Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is an award-winning lawyer in local authorities who is also in charge of the Windrush Justice Campaign, which is an organisation helping victims of the Windrush scandal negotiate the very complex process of trying to rebuild their lives and get compensation from the government scheme. Pauline Campbell has also written her own memoir and commentary on racism in Britain today. It's called Rice and Peas and Fish and Chips. Welcome, Pauline, and thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I guess let's just start with the title of the book, Rice and Peas and Fish and Chips. Does that sum up your multicultural upbringing? Yes. One of the most important things is that when we were growing up, we couldn't decide what we liked best. Was it rice and peas or was it fish and chips? And on a Saturday night, mum would give us some money to go to the top of the road to get some fish and chips, which we loved. And on a Sunday, we'd have rice and peas and we loved them equally. So that was a perfect title for the book because it sums up our generation. It sums up me. I want to delve into all of that because the point of this book is one woman, one family's experience of of growing up in Britain. But but I just want to talk about Windrush because it's been in the news recently because so few people have successfully claimed compensation. Um, and, and this is years after the scandal. It's years after the, it's decades after the injustice in many cases. So I just want to get a sense from you of where you think we're at with that. I mean, Does it need tearing up and starting again? I believe that there's two ways of looking at this. Tearing it up and starting again is only going to further delay the process. And that is what's the most worrying part of all. And what I am of the opinion of is that the key to the problems we're having with the Windrush is that people don't trust the system. A generation who were invited here by the government to help rebuild Britain after the war but decades later as pensioners were wrongly classified as illegal immigrants. And because of that, they're not coming forward and they're not claiming as much as they would. And even when they do claim, they have to wait over 400 days plus for a result in whether they're going to be paid or not. But I have found that the biggest issue for me is that the government require individuals to not only provide a plethora of documentation, but they also ask within the requirement to tell you on the application form how this has impacted on your life. Now, what is the necessity of asking somebody on top of the documentation to put in writing how this has impacted on your life? And if you want to rip anything up, that is the element of that criteria that I believe needs to be ripped up. Because I've had to sit and listen to people cry their heart out about how they feel, because we as lawyers and organisers and helpers have to put it in writing within the application. So I believe we need to keep going with the process because to stop it will only delay it further and will give the Home Office an excuse to delay things even more. But we need to look at the process itself and get rid of that criteria, which is requiring an individual to go to the heart of their pain and put it in on paper how this has impacted on them. Do you think this system, which let's remember has only been set up very recently, and with lots of black people involved in it, is racist? I think it lacks understanding of the people that are involved and the people that are affected by it. Is it racist? I think it is ignorant. It lacks an understanding. Racism is linked to some form of treating someone inferior with an inferiority. And when it comes to black people... I believe that the impact element of it is racist because asking somebody to dig deep into themselves and to give you details of their pain is not necessary. And why do people have to go to that extra hurdle? Why is it when you look at other elements within society, when people are claiming compensation, why is it that they have to do this when others don't? And that tells me that they're putting us to an additional standard of proof 
in order to prove that we were hurt by this and prove that we suffered pain. And if that is racist, then I would say, yes, that aspect of it is racist. When I was looking at the paperwork and looking at the historical cases, the first few cases, when you think about the committees that went together to look at some cases where people were actually put in deportation and detention centres, you've got to think about the fact that somebody is saying to an individual, what airport should we drop you off at when you go back to the Caribbean? And this person is saying, I don't know what you're talking about because I've never been to Jamaica. I don't know what airport I need to be left at. And that shows the lack of understanding of the person at the other end of that conversation. The thought that you would put somebody on a plane and send them back to something they know nothing about and not have any empathy and any understanding of the detrimental effect that is going to have on not just that person, but their entire family has got to be racist. It can't be anything other than that. Now, in all the people you've seen, is there any sense that they trust the system or the authorities or the nation anymore? Or is that shattered? It started with David Cameron and Theresa May in relation to all the issues that we had earlier on. And people don't really go to the heart of this. Why did this begin? Why did this hostile environment start? And it started in 2012, 2014, when UKIP were really obtaining a number of votes. And they would take, people were actually moving to UKIP. And David Cameron was thinking, what can we do to tell people that we're going to be harder on immigration? And Theresa May and the hostile environment was created on the back of that. And so for me, how I look at it is that people have been brought into this by something they had nothing to do with. And that's what immigration is. Immigration is one of the most powerful tools that politicians have in winning and losing votes. And black people and people who are not born in this country, whether they're black or brown, Eastern European, will always be at the the end of that. And that's what I find makes people not trust the system. Do you trust it? I don't trust the system where, in the book, I looked at it very practically. I said, you want to create a system in which you want people to believe in you. And you as a government in 1976 and in 1965 and in 1968, you created the Race Relations Act saying we need to make things fairer for people. We need to open the way and and introduce legislation that is going to quite try and level the grounds for people who are experiencing racism in this country. But when I look to the legislation, the government are asking a country to accept something, to open their minds and be more innovative and more practical in their thinking about people of colour and opportunities. Yet when you look at that government, there wasn't one black face within it. So what you're doing is you're telling a country to do something but you're not doing it yourself. So for me, when I looked at the history and the issues, I realised that's why nothing's working and that's why I don't trust it. Because we had to wait until 1987 to see someone that looked like us in Parliament. 1987, with the famous four. And it was only at that point that we thought, maybe we have a voice, maybe. So, no, I think it's taken too long and I think the damage has been done. And it's so sad that that has happened. Immigration within politics, um, you know, I suppose has framed your life the way you've written it. And the, the book, you know, begins with the politics of the time, which is Enoch Powell's speech about the black man holding the whip hand over the white man um, within 10 to 15 years and the Immigration Act of 1971. Um, Now, when you look back on your early years, obviously you you, you can frame it that way. But how aware of the political environment was your family? I say that as a child, 
all children, if they're blessed with a good family and a good background, live in a world of Shangri-La. That's how I describe it in some of my work. Because when you're young and you're growing up, you're just like any other child. You go to the shops, you look at your mum eagerly when she, you hear the ice cream van outside and you think, she, you pray she's going to put her hand in her purse and give you some money to get some ice creams. And you run to the ice cream van with your white friends. After school, you run to the sweet shop with your white friends. You play in the streets and in the parks and go to school with your white friends. And our parents was dealing with all of this as we were growing up. And it never affected us because they kind of just shielded us from it. They never talked about it. They just got on with it. And so I would say that as a child, that was the best time of my life because that's before I knew what racism was. And our parents kept it away from us for as long as they could. And um, they did what they needed to, to give us a better life. But they were stronger than we could have ever have been. Because I, I give you a description of my uncle lived in Wolverhampton at the time that Enoch Powell had made that speech. And Enoch Powell's constituency was in Wolverhampton. And my uncle had to go past Enoch Powell's office every day. And I said, uncle, what did you do? I mean, this speech was made. Enoch Powell was saying all these things. What did you do when you walked past his, his building? And my uncle said, we just walked on the other side of the road. That's all we did. We just walked on the other side of the road. And I said, you know what? That tells me that the resilience and the strength of our families at a time when they were dealing with all of this is amazing. So tell me about your parents. When did they come here and where from? Mum and Dad came from Jamaica. Dad was in, lived in St Elizabeth and Mum lived in St Anne's in Jamaica. So um, they came here. Dad came first and then um, he used what you call a pardoner system because in when you came here in the 60s, late 50s, early 60s, banks would not give loans to black people. They wouldn't. The banking system was completely racist. So what happened was black people had to find their own way of saving. So what they did was they created what you call a partner. And a partner is where an elderly member of the community who is trusted will take money from each member of the community and you'll have a group of people that put in the pot. And it can run for six months, sometimes a year, sometimes less. And at the end of it, every week, someone takes the whole pot and you call it your drawer. So your drawer is your pot. And that's what black people do. They still do it now. Partners are still being used now. And when dad got his first drawer, he sent for mum and brought her over from Jamaica. And um, it's so enlightening to think that we had to manage and find a way and black people did they just got on with it and did what they needed to so when they came over it, we lived in a tenement in Hackney on a road called Powerscroft Road with I think it was three or four other families but my sister and I were really young so mum when I asked her what it was like all she says to me is it was hard and that's what she says it was hard and so you know that we were all in one room and you'd put your money in a meter and mum would say by the time she put her money in the meter and went upstairs to use the cooker, somebody else had used it. So she'd have to go back downstairs and put the money in the meter. Um, so it, I can't imagine what it was like because I was too young, but we were, we were looked after. We did what we needed to do. So that was their beginnings in this country. And they left a daughter in Jamaica, didn't they? Which must have been incredibly hard. Yeah, um, a lot of families did that because for my mum, when she left my sister um, in Jamaica, um, my grandmother wanted my sister to stay with her. So mum came here without her. But I will tell you this, and I think every single family did it. Every time we sat down to eat, mum would say, Lord Jesus, I wonder if Andrea is eating I wonder. And my mum would never stop. Every single time she would say that. And Andrea came when she was 19. And that's because granny was getting too old and mum wanted her here. So Andrea came and joined us when she was 19. And for her, I put it in the book that so many families had to deal with this new, this new sibling 
in their lives who we didn't know. And we thought it was hard for us, but it was harder for them. And it was only when I grew up and I wrote the book, I looked back at what my sister went through. I realized that it was harder for her than it was for us because she was giving up everything she knew. And we already knew this country. We were already settled and she wasn't. So I I really appreciate how hard it was for her. But it took me a while to see that, which I'm glad I see it. And writing the book helped me to see that. Well, tell me why you wrote the book. I wrote the book because I wanted people to get to, I wanted to introduce my generation to the white population. And one of the most significant elements of the book is the foreword. The foreword of my book is not written by a black person. It's written by a white man called Colin Freeman, who is, who writes for the Telegraph. And the reason I asked Colin Freeman to write the foreword for my book was because He wrote a blog in 2015 about Grange Hill and how significant seeing Benny Green walking on that school through those school gates meant to him. And he said he learned more about racism watching the episodes of Grange Hill on racism than he would from anyone. And he lived in a village in Scotland and he didn't know anyone. So he said to him that was important. So he reached out to me when I read his blog and I asked him to do it and he didn't want to do it. But I persuaded him and said, the reason you need to do it is because this is for you. It's an understanding of us and I'm introducing you to us. And he did a brilliant forward. So this book is for everybody who wants to know who we are, where we've come from and where we're going. One of the moments of the time that you raise in the book is Eric Clapton's racist outburst at a concert. Again, is that something that you remember or is that something you're looking back on? That's something that I knew nothing about until I did my research, which really scared me. And what I did was I found this fantastic documentary on Rock Against Racism. It was brilliant. It was like in a series of about four bits on YouTube and I kept going from one bit to the other and it showed the history of Rock Against Racism and how it was created And Rock Against Racism was created because of Eric Clapton's outburst, because they said, this is disgusting. This man has built his life on black people's music, yet he's doing this. And so for me, it made me realise that our history is hidden because had I not come across Rock Against Racism and then after that I bought the book and I got to grips with what it was, I didn't know. So it was really good for me to see that. And Rock Against Racism was a fantastic movement. Left-wing activists know the revolutionary power of music. Rock Against Racism was born. At first, as a newspaper published by seasoned campaigner Red Saunders. Love music, hate racism. It brought people of different races and creeds together under a a passionate banner, a very simple idea to bring politics and music together to challenge racism. I mean, because you listened to The Beat and the specials and UB40 as a child, but were you aware of them as part of Rock Against Racism? No, because The Beat and um, UB40 and all these kind of groups came up after Rock Against Racism. That's the saddest thing about Rock Against Racism. It stopped in the early 80s. It kind of like just just teepered out, just, just went. Because they said, we're now getting groups like The Beat, we're now getting groups like The Specials, who have, are mixed. You never used to get black and white groups together. But what The Specials did and what The Beat did was they started to put black and white artists together on the same stage. And their music, you'd be 40, what I would do to meet Ali Campbell is, I won't talk about it. I had his picture on my wall and I wanted to, I loved it. And so for me, that was a, a move, a progress on from Rock Against Racism. But one thing you learn is that when it comes to racism, unfortunately, there's a time and a shelf space. Rock Against Racism should never have ended. It should have evolved. It should have continued, but it kind of ended. 
So a lot of people don't even know what Rock Against Racism is. And that shouldn't be the case because it should have continued alongside the beat, alongside UB40. But they said they were going to hand the mantra over to these groups like the, um, like, um, yeah, the beat. And then there was Selector and then there was UB40. They said, let's hand over the mantra to these young people. And they just weren't ready to take that mantra on. And so it all went. And do you think that shelf life is something that still exists now? I mean, particularly in the in the wake of the George Floyd murder. Um, you know, are we reaching the shelf life on caring about racism in this particular period? I would say that I tell everybody that we have a very short shelf life at the moment, but this is different for me. Because when Stephen Lawrence was murdered, it was mammoth. Everybody was talking about how important it was that the Lawrences got justice for the murder of their child. Two young black men minding their own business at a bus stop in South London 18 years ago. One, teenager Stephen Lawrence, was swallowed up by a gang of five white youths forced to the ground and stabbed twice. And black people grouped together and everybody got on and everybody was on it. And then we had the institutional racism. We had all these reports. But then once again, that kind of like ebbed away. But this is different. And the reason I say this is different is because for the first time ever, and I don't know if you'll agree with me, Krishna, but I believe for the first time ever, you've got young, white, people and older white people standing alongside us in relation to this fight. If not now, when? How many more people have to die? How many more of us have to lose our lives before change happens? No matter how many times your government can tell you don't fight for it, you have to, because you have the ability to, so why wouldn't you? because they're looking at it and seeing it for what it is. Inequality, which is unjustified in every shape and every form. So I believe that we are in a good place now, but we need to keep this momentum going and we need to share our experiences, white, black, brown, it does not matter. We all need to share our experiences together. But what you also raise in the book is um, is the way certain parts of the British establishment now want to reframe inequality um, and and to equate, you know, white deprivation um, with black deprivation and white inequality with black inequality and say, actually, we just need to tackle inequality um, and take the racism bit out. Because there are some people, again, and we saw it with the Sewell report, um, who who basically want to deny that structural racism is a factor in many things, um, you know, and, uh, and, and to look at it in the context of the whole country. Mm, don't get me started on that. You don't want me to get started on... I, I, the thing for me on that question is that the gov- when I put it in the chapter f- um, Fight for Fairness, when you look at what the government are doing, they are trying to dilute the issue of racism. And I don't know why it's such a problem to admit that there's a problem. It's very different, but it's no different to what they've done in the past because equality is fine. I think the problem that we have is that people mix up the fight for fairness in relation to black people and inequality with us wanting more than other people. They seem to think that if black people are saying that things are not fair for them, that we believe that we want more or we want to aspire to a higher level than the people or our counterparts. And that's not what this is about at all. We have this lack of acknowledgement that racism is something that everybody can experience at the hands of another person, irrespective of where they live. And geographical area has absolutely nothing to do with it. Because when you think about it, 
We've looked at how many, I made notes about how many professors we have in this country and what colour they are. And the majority of them are white males. And then you have white females. But in our universities, the minute number of professors of colour is, it's so telling because there are so many qualified graduates out there who have achieved their goals academically, who just can't get through. So if you're saying that somebody is not going to achieve their goals because of the geographical area in which they live, what do you say about those people who have surpassed and hit that glass ceiling and done all those things that they need to do and they still can't get the jobs they want, even when they are qualified? What's the difference between them and a young boy who is excluded from school? Nothing, because they're still not getting the opportunities that other people are getting. And the government just pretend that's not happening and they've not addressed that. So the fight for fairness is flawed. What what, what some of them say is um, that it's not as simple as racism because there are different levels of achievement in different racial groups. Um, and if um, Indians and Chinese do so well, then racism can't be the reason Bangladeshis and blacks don't. Mm. I think that that is the saddest part of all, because one of the things I talked about when I was at school, I was told at the age of 15 that I was not A-level material by a teacher. Now, one of the things I didn't know that was happening at the time was that they had created Caribbean children in the 70s were doing very badly in schools. And so... um, At the time, the Secretary of Education, um, Shirley Williams, I think, made the decision that they were going to actually do a commission on this, have a look at what was going wrong. And so they created and put together the Rampton Committee, and it was called the Rampton Report. And what it did was it looked at the issues as to why Caribbean children weren't doing as well as their counterparts. And what it determined was that there was a lack of training on the part of teachers to understand young children of Caribbean background. It showed that there was a lack of expectation when you looked at a Caribbean child and the Caribbean children believed that lack of expectation. And what it did was it made them believe the hype that they weren't good enough. And the Rampton Report gave a fantastic blueprint of all the things that we needed to think about in making it possible for us to aspire and do better at school. And at the end of it, the government made the determination exactly with what they've done now with Fight for Fairness, that this isn't about Caribbean children. This is about all children. And we need to look at how we're going to deal with them as as a whole, rather than deal with the Rampton Report. But the scariest part of all was one of the articles said, why do you think that Caribbean children are actually not doing, in a, are not actually achieving what they should be achieving. Don't you think that this could be their capability? Don't you think that this could be they're doing exactly what they could do? And so it was really sad to think that people believe that if we say that we're not doing well, it's because that's just as good as we are. So tell me about your own experience. I mean, I introduced you as a lawyer at the top of this podcast, but obviously that's been a long journey. And you were initially told you weren't even A-level material. So what happened? Well, what happened was when I was in my 30s, Stephen Lawrence's case flew up. It, it, It came up and it was... For me, at the time, I was a member in the secretary of the Black Workers Group in Islington Council because I was a housing benefits officer for 14 years. And it was a good job and it paid well. But as you grow older, you reach into yourself and you realise that if you want to be someone different, you have to find that in yourself. And when I watched the Lawrences and I would represent people on disciplinaries and I would look at the fact that all their managers were white and these officers were fighting people and they were the sole black person in the room and everybody else was white... I realised that I had a gift. I had a gift for advocacy. I had a gift for drafting. And I had a gift for wiping the floor with them. And I I shouldn't say this, but I really took pleasure in the fact that I could help somebody and give them a voice. 
And so I had to think at the age of 33, what is it that I want with my life now? And I decided I'm good at drafting. I'm good at presenting. I should do a law degree. And I've always wanted to be a lawyer. Even at the age of 15, I wanted to be a lawyer. So I did a law degree. And when I got the law degree, I would say the scariest part of all is when you do all your qualifications and you get to the point where somebody's got to take a punt on you. It's out of your hands and you have to find a training contract. And that was the scariest part for me because I thought, is somebody going to take a punt on me? And thankfully, somebody did. And that was Kent Magistrates Court. Um, And it was, I walked into that interview and they like people who have got previous work experience. But Kent was miles away from where I lived. I lived in Tottenham. So I went to this interview and there was these two white males sitting at the table and they were really nice. I had to do a presentation on antisocial behaviour and then they asked me some questions about the law and bail and all of these stuff. And then they said to me, why should we give you this job? And I thought, you know what, Pauline, you just got to be honest because you could do all the right things because I'm an asset. I do all the right. I I work really hard, blah, blah, blah. And I said, because you're not going to get anyone like me. There's nobody that you have on your staff that is going to be like me. And I will bring something new to your organization. And I said it as it was, not with any arrogance, but because it was important that they knew that I'm proud of who I am. And if you take me, you take me as I am. Um, And I got the job. I got the job as a trainee solicitor working for Kent at the age of 39. I couldn't believe it. So it seems to me that your whole story is about finding self-belief. Um, so, so how did you go from the 15-year-old told you're not good enough to do A-levels to believing in yourself? Time. It comes with time and it comes with what you see around you. It comes with looking at your dad and growing up and understanding your parents more. It comes with knowing that within yourself, you must never settle. And I think we all get to that point where we meet that juncture in the road where we have to make a decision. Are we going to stay where we are because it's easier or are we going to move on and progress? And we all make the decision and it's, there's no right or wrong answer to that. So for me, it was time and belief and strength. And the job I did as a benefits officer required a lot of hard work, a lot of technical knowledge. And it made me realise that I was a lot brighter than people said I was and I was respected and I was growing in confidence. The older you get, the more confident you get in who you are and you grab that confidence and you run with it and you build on it. And that's uh, that's what got me there, I think. Within all of this conversation, um, you know, whenever whenever I do an interview with somebody about racism, I know that there are people in the audience who are going, oh, God, not another interview about racism, you know. Um, It's boring. You know, when are they going to stop going on about it? What's your response to that? My response to that is that I don't really care that that's how you feel because at the end of the day, I want you to step into my shoes for five minutes and understand how important it is that we keep talking about it, that we keep talking about the importance of equality because the day we stop talking about it is the day that it will continue and continue in perpetuity. For us as individuals, it's so sad that we are constantly having to talk about this. We shouldn't be talking about it. This is something, Christian, that we should not be talking about anymore. It should be over And we should be living in the world of Star Trek where everybody is treated exactly the same, where you've got Uhuru and you've got Chekhov and you've got Captain Kirk and you've got this world where everything should be right. That is where we should be. But unfortunately, we only have to look at what happened to our poor three footballers just a few months ago or look at what's happening in Yorkshire cricket. We only need to have a look at that to tell us that is why we need to keep talking about it. So if you could just change the world, what would you do? I would do everything I could to dispel the myth that, as Martin Luther said, Luther King said one day, somebody told a lie one day. Somebody told a lie that because of the colour of this, because of the colour of this, 
I'm inferior to somebody else. And that's the biggest lie ever. And my one thing would be if I could wave a magic wand and dispel that myth that because somebody's skin colour is different to somebody else's, they are inferior to me, which is a complete and utter myth. So I want to dispel that myth. And if I could, the world would be a wonderful place because inequality, as far as racism is concerned, would no longer exist. And if I ask you today for lunch, rice and peas or fish and chips? I would say rice and peas for mum and I'd say fish and chips for my mates. It's impossible to separate them. I can't do it fishing, it's impossible. Pauline Campbell, thank you very much indeed for joining us and sharing your ways to change the world. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Our producer is Freya Pickford. Until next time, bye-bye.